Thank you, Jonathan. And also thank you to the Institute of Medicine and workshop organizers for inviting me here to speak today. So I've been asked to speak about parent perceptions of bullying as well as concordance with student reports. So I'll briefly review some of the literature in the area, and then I'll talk about two studies I've conducted with colleagues in related areas, and I'll close with some implications. I should note that in contrast to some of the other areas being discussed today, there's relatively less known about these issues with parents. So particularly for the two studies that I've, I've worked on, I should have you view them as sort of basic research that could be expanded in the future into more sophisticated models and questions. So in terms of parental perceptions of bullying, broadly we know that bullying is a concern for parents. For example, parents of children who are transitioning from primary to secondary school cite bullying and peer problems as some of their biggest concerns they're worried about for their children. That said, parents across multiple studies tend to report lower rates of bullying involvement for their children than children say is actually occurring. Although notably and interestingly, the discrepancies between parent and student reports are often less than the discrepancies between teacher and student reports. Um, some studies have also suggested that it might be that discrepancies vary based on the type of bullying being assessed. So for example, Wasdorp and Bradshaw conducted a study of African American children focused on relational aggression, and parents and children in general reported relatively similar rates. Um, conversely, another study of bullying among elementary school students showed that children uh, felt that they were involved in physical bullying and being and to have been bullied um, than their parents believed had had these same experiences. There's also some interesting new research that looks at the effects of child sex in terms of concordance. So for example, in a study of third through eighth grade students of children and their parents as well, there was a stronger agreement between parents and their boys' reports of bullying than parent reports and girls' reports of bullying. And authors here speculate that this might be because the type of bullying boys are involved with might be more obvious and in turn reach the attention of the school, which in turn would result in parental awareness. Whereas perhaps if girls' involvement in bullying is less obvious, it wouldn't have um, that same school intervention and subsequent parent involvement. Part of the reason that there might be these discrepancies um, in terms of youth and parent reports is that youth say they don't often actually reach out to parents or similarly to other adults when they're being um, involved in bullying experiences. Interestingly, however, if you ask parents, you know, do you think your children will come talk to you if you're involved in bullying, in bullying parents think that yes, their kids would talk to them about it. So there's a big bit of a mismatch here. And there's certainly another range of factors that I won't go into that affect general rates of whether kids decide to report their bullying um, involvement to someone else. Turning to parent responses to bullying, we know certainly that many parents have conversations with their children about bullying, um, what it looks like, and how it could affect them. Uh, my children probably think we have too many conversations in my home about these issues. Um, but once you have a kid who's involved um, in bullying, uh, parent responses tend to vary a little bit. Um, based on whether the child is involved as a perpetrator or the child is involved as a victim. So for example, Fex and colleagues found that among children who reported bullying others, only one third of them said that yes, my parents talked to me about that bullying perpetration. And similar findings um, emerged in a study bound by um, Hudamadi and Pateraki, with 24% of kids bullying others saying that their parents talked to them about it, which was in sharp contrast to the 62% who were being victimized, who said, yes, my parents talked to me about those victimization experiences. So given that, when parents do find out what's going on in terms of their kids' bullying involvement, what do they do? Well, often we see that parents have some great responses, and parents certainly care about their kids' well-being. But some studies have shown um, somewhat disturbing findings in terms of what parents do. So in a study of Dutch elementary school students, 24% um, of the kids who said their parents knew what was going on said that, but my parents really didn't do anything to stop it at all. Um, thankfully, 37% of the kids said that their parents did try to intervene, um, but there was varying levels of effectiveness here. So 4% of the students said that when their parents intervened, the victimization became worse. 16% said the victimization remained the same. But 17% did, in fact, say that victimization decreased as a result of the parents becoming involved. So that's hopeful. I should also note that, in general, studies show that parents of younger children are more likely to intervene than parents of older children. Um, 
Next, um, some interesting new research has looked at how parent perceptions of school climate will affect how much they decide to get involved in terms of bullying episodes. An interesting study by Wasdorp and colleagues found that, contrary to their expectations, it was in fact parents who perceived the climate to be better who were less likely to get involved in terms of bullying. And here the speculation was that, well, if parent perceives the climate is strong, they may also in turn think that the school is doing a good job addressing the problem and so that perhaps they don't need to um, become involved. But it's important to note that research suggests that when parents do become involved and provide appropriate supports, often the negative effects of bullying can be diminished. So for example, one study found that among victimized youth, those who reported higher parental support were less likely to report suicidal ideation than victimized youth who reported less parental support. So we really do know that when parents become involved and provide appropriate supports, some of the negative effects um, can be minimized. Okay, I'd like to turn briefly to two studies I've worked on with colleagues that get at this issue of parent responses and concordance about bullying. So really quickly, um, the first study had matched data from 205 uh, fifth grade students and their parents. Again, as I mentioned before, this is very basic um, research. More needs to be done in this area. But in this case, we were lucky to have this matched data. Um, kids came from about 22 elementary schools, as you see up there, and were ethnically diverse. So essentially what we did was we had the kids complete the University of Illinois Bully and Peer Victimization Skills, um, which tapped into perpetration and victimization. Also, um, one of my interests that um, lines up with something Dr. Eswaj was talking about earlier was the extent to which Bullying lines up with other forms of victimization, both in the home and elsewhere. So um, in this study, we were looking at child maltreatment and exposure to domestic violence as well. We asked parents about their attitudes toward bullying, their awareness of it, and what they did if they found out their child was involved. And we also asked both parents and kids about family characteristics and functioning, so things like conflict, support, and monitoring. So turning to concordance first. Um, if you see in the top row, um, that's whether the parent believed the child had been teased or didn't think the child had been teased. And I should note before going into these slides that overall, consistent with other research, kids reported more bullying involvement than parents thought was occurring. But nonetheless, if we think about concordance, um, we see that whereas in 10.5% of the cases, both the parent and the child said, yes, this child has been teased, in about 5.5% of the cases, the child reported being teased but the parent didn't think the child had been teased. So certainly some kids whose parents aren't picking up their experiences. Um, rates are even higher, as might be expected when you look at bullying perpetration. So here again, you have whether parents thought their child had teased others, and then the child's report of whether they teased others. And you see that in 11% of the cases, the child said, yes, I perpetrate bullying behaviors, and the parent said, no, my child doesn't. Um, I also want to quickly highlight, because I, I found this to be interesting, in about a third of the cases of parents, they said they thought their child had been teased, but the child did not report being teased. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, and that occurred less often for teasing others. So about 9% of parents thought their child had teased others when kids said, no, that wasn't the case for me. In terms of other additional key findings from this study, um, notably, 37% of parents indicated that schools should really deal with bullying without parental uh, interference. Um, as we know from some of the work on prevention that we'll get to in a moment, that's a problem because we do want parents to be involved in this process. In terms of how parents thought the kids should respond to bullying, another 37% here said kids should fight back. 30% um, said kids should just sort of stay out of the way and avoid the bully. Um, and the majority of parents said that kids should stand up for themselves in these cases. And just also of note in terms of home environments, home environments were linked to bullying involvement, but only based on child self-report data. So in other words, when parents were reporting on the home environment, that didn't line up to the child's uh, bullying experiences. But nonetheless, based on what the children said, um, for kids who were victims of bullying, they had homes in which there was greater levels of criticism, fewer rules, and more child maltreatment. And for bullies, they reported a lack of supervision within the home, more child maltreatment, and more exposure to domestic violence. And these findings are consistent with other work that's shown the overlap between bullying involvement and um, family uh, violence as well. Okay, turning next to parent perceptions of bullying, and this is some uh, recent work I've done with Dr. Jen Green and others at the Social Adjustment and Bullying Prevention Lab, 
Unfortunately here, this is not matched data, um, but I want to talk a little bit about how kids perceive their bullying involvement being linked to mental health and how parents think their kids' involvement is linked to mental health. And I think it's um, interesting, although again, it's limited in that it's not matched. So here we have third through eighth grade children and their parents. Um, and 159 parents responded. Interestingly, and not surprisingly necessarily, parents were more likely to respond um, when they were parents of younger children. So at the middle school ages, we had fewer parents responding. In this case, uh, the children completed the California Bully Victimization Scale, and parents completed a modified version. Uh, related to, to discussions of de definitions mentioned earlier, the CBVS gets issues like power and balance um, and the full scope of, of the definition of uh, CDC's definition now of bullying. Um, we also provided parents with a definition of bullying examples that was based on the OVAS bullying uh, question. And then we gave them the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which essentially gets at different areas of functioning um, for kids. And the parents also completed that for their children to get at mental health. So what did we find? Um, hopefully you can see here, because at the bottom, just in terms of rates of bullying as reported by parents and students, uh, not surprisingly, you can see that across the board, kids are reporting more bullying than their parents are reporting in all of these domains. And in terms of the rates, you'll see that they're pretty analogous to what was mentioned earlier by Dr. Limber, um, forms like teasing and rumor spreading being more common um, than things like being hit or sexual bullying. Um, and notably, there are particularly striking difference between students and kids when it came to cyberbullying, um, which would make sense that maybe the parents are less aware of what's going on with the children online. Um, getting back to who kids want to speak to about bullying, in this study, kids said they would be most likely to go to a peer if they were dealing with bullying, um, followed by an adult at home. But really, only one third of the kids said, yes, I'd be willing to reach out to a parent and guardian. Interestingly, though, and importantly, for those kids who decided to reach out, those kids in the minority group who did, they said that, on average, the parents and adults at home were really helpful, actually, in helping to negotiate the incidence of bullying. So while few kids approach their parents or guardians, when they do approach the parents or guardians, they feel like effective solutions are being generated. Um, one finding I found to be somewhat problematic, uh, we know that kids often say they miss school because they're being afraid of bullying. Um, and we saw that in this study as well. About a third of the kids said they would miss school for fear of being bullied. But only about 4% of the parents said that they thought their kids um, would miss school due to bullying. So next, as I mentioned, I wanted to look a little bit about how student and parent reports of youth mental health compared. So in other words, among kids who have been victimized, how did those kids talk about their mental health? And then among parents who said their children had been victimized, how did the parents um, perceive their children's mental health? So again, this is based on the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. And what you can see here is the green line at the top reflects student report, and the blue line toward the bottom reflects parent report. And again, this is kind of some basic uh, foundational research here, but essentially what the slide is showing is that across all these different domains, um, kids who are involved in bullying report more challenges um, than parents think their kids involved in bullying experience, if that makes sense. So in other words, kids are reporting more associated mental health difficulties than parents feel their kids are, are experiencing, which is problematic, as you could imagine. Perhaps parents aren't understanding the true impact of what's going on for their children. So what can we think about in terms of making meaning out of these discrepancies and what implications might there be? Well, we know from Nishna that when discrepancies between parents and children exist, unfortunately, parents often are then minimizing their children's experiences, which probably leads to fewer interventions and less support, which is problematic for the children. We can also think a little bit about the broader literature on child psychopathology and informant discrepancies. We know that these discrepancies really occur in a number of areas um, in terms of behavioral problems, emotional problems, so that's not new. But we also often know in the broader literature that when greater discrepancies exist, um, the kids often more dis or have worse outcomes in terms of mental health. So the same might play itself out here, um, that when parents aren't understanding what's going on for the kids, the children's mental health might be compromised. And while I think this is a smaller point um, in terms of our parents really reporting on kids who are truly bullied, I just want to refer back to the initial slide we looked at where 31% of the parents thought their child was teased, but the child wasn't teased. So when you're not dealing with matched data, for example, in this slide on mental health I showed you, it might be that part of the reason the mental health reports from parents are lower is because those are, they're reporting on kids who might not actually be involved in bullying. 
Okay, and I am just about out of time, so I'll talk about summaries and implications quickly. Um, as Dr. Bradshaw and others noted, we do know that parent involvement is a key to bullying prevention. So the meta-analysis by Toffee and Farrington really said that parental uh, involvement is one component that's associated with better outcomes. So we need to encourage parents to be involved. And as a part of this, to provide them with more basic and nuanced information about bullying, what it looks like, what effects are, how to appropriately um, talk to their children about it. And just in closing, I won't go into this in detail, but parents often say, well, what can I do? Uh, Lovegrove and colleagues in 2013 published a nice piece on what parents really can do to help children and highlighted the five areas, um, or six areas noted here. Um, so with that, I will close, and thank you very much. Thank you.